angel looks at both of them and said, I've been sent here to grant you each a request. Said, I want to know from you what would make your days better, what would make you more happy and enjoyable in life, and I'm here to grant that request to you. So the wife knew her answer immediately. She said, I'd love to travel the world. Boom, right in her hands. Tickets to airports, tickets to hotels, food, all that. Everything she needed was right there in her hand. The husband, he began to think, said, well, I guess what would make me more happy, better days, uh, better life? Uh, I'll tell you what, I know what it is. It's to have a wife 30 years younger than me. And boom, the angel made him 90 years old. So, you got to watch what you ask for to make you happy. You see, it may, may turn around on you just for a minute. So today I, I was pondering on what would be a message that the Lord would have for us as we wrap up this year today. We start a new year tomorrow. To be able to look and say, what is one thing maybe we can focus in on that could be a message on what we ought to focus in on for the whole year. And I came across this uh, scripture as I was just reading. I thought, man, that, that's it. It said, the one who desires life and to love and to see good days. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because if you don't answer yes to this, you probably need to go see somebody else for help. That, that, is that not what we want? Who doesn't want life, love, and good days? I mean, that just wraps it up for lost people or saved people. That's, that's just what we want. And as I began to look at that verse, I said, well, what's all around that verse? What's before that verse? What's after that verse? Because it's nestled right in a series of uh, verses that... Uh, I wanted to glean for myself to say, what is it that's so tied to having life, love, and good days? Jesus even said it this way, I've come to give you life, and that more abundantly, that abundant life. And, 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 and this passage that Peter writes in these few verses really sum it up on some things we need to focus in on. Now, you may be thinking, well... <clears throat> Good circumstances would help. Well, you have to remember who he's writing this to. He's writing it to the persecuted church. And he doesn't write anywhere in what I'm about to preach that says, get these bad circumstances of persecution out of the way. Because they're not going to stop. They just continued on. So that's not what it is. And then you may be thinking, well, I know what it is. It's better finances better health, more fame, a better position, a better job, a better car, a better house, a little more income security. Those are the things, if you'll tell us that, I know that's going to make me have more life, love, and good days. Well, there's somebody that had all that. His name was Solomon. He was the richest man in the world, so wealth and finances were all secured because Nobody was richer than him. We don't see anything in the scriptures that said he had health problems. He had fame all over the world, people knew. They even came to Solomon to see all the things that they had heard about. He had position. He was the king. He had power. He was the king. He had relationships. He had 700 wives. He had plenty of relationships. So everything that could look outwardly, he kind of would have it going on. And he wrote this. Let me go back. This is the title of the message, Pursuing Life in Good Days, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. But this is what Solomon said. So I hated life. Wait, buddy, you got it going on like nobody else. But what he was looking at in those verses, he was talking about apart from the Lord and a commitment to the Lord, just all those things that he had worked for to get, 
just looking at that apart from what God is in our life, he just hated life. So our pursuit of a career, our pursuit of money, our pursuit of fame, our pursuit of position, that's not going to cut it. Because for Solomon, he had all that, and he said, I, I hate life. <laughs> Why live? He said, buddy, you got it all going. But he didn't at that time. The God wasn't the center of his life. And so we begin to look that way. And even when you, we read that verse, life to love and good days, kind of reminds me of that phrase in the Declaration of Independence when it talks about our inalienable rights to what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That even our Declaration of Independence of, as a nation, we wanted every individual to equally be able to pursue life, liberty, and their pursuit of happiness, whatever that might be. And of course, that has taken a whole whirlwind of different roads from fame and fortune and riches and career and, and alcohol and drugs and whatever else people think is my pursuit of happiness has been their pursuit of happiness. We're just saying as a nation, you can pursue whatever you want to be happy, but it hadn't brought much happiness. And here... It's a little different way instead of what the Declaration of Independence says, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It says life, love, and good days. But it's clear what we need to do to accomplish that versus what the Declaration of Independence didn't tell us how to have that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So as we look at 1 Peter 3, 8, where our verse 10 nestled in the middle, we're going to look at five things that we all have to keep this next year if we're going to have life, love, and good days. Remember them because they all start with keep. you got to keep them. If you lose any of them, you won't have life, love, and good days. And again, we're not talking about being exempt from negative because the people he wrote this to were very fond of, not fond, very aware of negative since they were in the middle of persecution. So let's look. Number one, keeping a loving, unifying attitude. Our attitude's everything. That's how we view life. And so Peter says, to sum up all that he'd said before, here's what I need to tell you. All of you, let me go ahead and make this point because uh, some of you say, well, this doesn't apply to me. <laughs> uh, it's almost like Peter saying, no, this applies to everybody. He kind of makes that little few words there. All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. That's what you need to do. You need to have that kind of attitude in life if you're going to have life, love, and good days. Let's kind of break that down. First one is harmonious. That's to think the same. Not be the same, but to think the same. Because we're all different. We have different personalities, uh, different hobbies. We have different spiritual gifts. We look at things differently. So we're, we're different. And that's not what it's talking about is be the same because unity is not the same as uniformity. See, we can be different and we are different, but we all have one goal. We all have one mindset and that's this. It's the kingdom of God and His word and His ways and His thoughts. That's what we're unified in. But we go about things sometimes differently. And God's made us different. It's just like up here, we got to hear great worship. But we didn't ask all these ma ma magi magicians, <laughs> musicians, but they're so good you think they're magicians. They just do it so well. We didn't ask him, them to all buy the same instrument, did we? We didn't say, you know, uh, Dennis, make them all have guitars because we want unity up here. We didn't sell, everybody has to have a piano. They all have different instruments that all make different noise. But when they're all done unified on the same song and in unity, how beautiful this sounds. And it wouldn't sound this beautiful if we all had every one of them playing the same instrument. The difference, unified, is beautiful music. Matter of fact, the music you love has many instruments in it most of the time. The same way here. We're different. 
But when God takes all of our differences and brings them together in a harmonious attitude, we make beautiful music together. It's called the church. And that's why we need to be harmonious. We need to think the same. Not be on the same page on the method, but on the goal. There's a different way. That's like D.L. Moody, the great preacher. Somebody came up to him one time and they said to Moody, they said, I don't like how you do evangelism. To which D.L. Moody looked at him and said, well, what are your methods of evangelism? The guy said, I don't have any. He said, I like my ways better. <laughs> I mean, there's different methods to do it. You know, do it this way or do it that way. Or we ought to do it that way. Those are always going to be there. But we all agree on what we want to do and what we want to accomplish. Why? Because we're harmonious. And if we're not harmonious, then there's going to be a, an issue. And it's in our attitude. We've got to think the same, which is this way of thinking. Next one is sympathetic. That's to share the same feelings. When you're sympathetic with somebody, you, you, you hear what they're going through, you kind of put that on you and you kind of feel that same way the best you can so you can sympathize with them. You read that they lost a loved one and you think, man, I remember when I lost a loved one and this is how it must feel to them right now. And I'm feeling what they're feeling and it almost, because you feel that way, it lends you to do something because you know how bad they're feeling and you feel like I need to send a card, I need to send an email, I need to pray for them, I need to do something because I know how they're feeling because now I've placed that feeling on myself. The Bible says, bear you one another's burdens. Put it on yourself. You know, Brother Tim, you're not going in a very good direction. So far you haven't told anything about me. It's always been about others. And it's all going to be this way because that's going to be the key to life and love and Good days. We begin to focus even more on others. And so we have this compassionate feeling toward other people. It's not about us. It's about them. See, see the connection here with the church? I'm harmonious with the members. I'm, i got to know what the members are going through. Why? How can I be sympathetic if I don't know what you're going through? If I asked you, I said, what is, the, uh, what is a lot of the membership going through? I don't know. Well, we've got to be plugged in enough to know so we can be sympathetic over it. Right? You can't be sympathetic over something you don't know. It takes that knowledge. This verse goes on to say, brotherly, showing unselfish love that unites the brethren. We're the brethren. We're brothers and sisters. We're the brethren. And we need to be brotherly or sisterly. He's saying that since we're the family of God, we have to act like the family of God and be brotherly and sisterly and treat each other as like brothers and sisters. That's how close a relationship Peter says the church should have. Some I've even heard say, you know, I'm closer to people in this church than I am to my own flesh and blood. That's brotherly and sisterly that, you, that bond is so close and unselfish as we love one another. And then he said, be kind-hearted. That strong feelings of emotion toward others that, that leads us to do kind things for one another. And, you know, we're sympathetic and we're loving, but even now that we're kind-hearted, we do kind things because now we're thinking, how can we do something for somebody else? Not just think about them. Maybe I can physically do something for them and be kind-hearted. And then the last one is to be humble in spirit. That's free from pride. See, pride tells me there's only really one person important. <laughs> That's what pride says. To him, it's all about you, what you're going through, what you're experiencing, and what you need. And That's what pride wants to say. But when we push pride out of the way, then it's others and others and others is the issue. And I'm putting others before myself. Every other character, quality that we pursue in the Bible will never be obtained without this one, humble in spirit. You can't obtain any of the rest of them. And there's a lot of character qualities in the Bible, none attainable until we get past this one, the humble 
in spirit, where we say it's not about me, it's about others, and then now these other characteristics can be obtained and those other virtues can be part of our life. So Peter starts out with this summary to say, look, you don't have life, love, and good days. Let me sum it up. You got to think of others. You got to put others first. You got to be sympathetic and kind hearted and humble and putting others' people's needs first and be harmonious and be unified in the body of Christ and all that the body of Christ wants to accomplish for the Lord. So, what's my first goal is to keep a loving and a unifying attitude that loves and cares for other people. First of all, that gets a lot of a load off me because when I'm looking at me, I look at all my difficulties, but when I look away from me, then they all become blind. I think it was Swindoll that coined the phrase, too many of us have ingrown eyeballitis. Ingrown eyeballs. You know, like an ingrown toenail, it does real good when it goes out, but when it starts turning back the other direction, you got some pain. When it starts coming back towards you and Ingrown eyeballs do that too, but when our eyeballs get on others, it's amazing what our attitude and our outlook at life becomes because we're looking at other people's difficulties, maybe not so much of our own. Second thing to keep is not only a loving and unifying attitude, but keep a forgiving, non-retaliatory mindset. Peter said, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a Blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So, a lot of time that a lot of things that keep people from having that better life, that good life, is because they're bitter, they're unforgiving, or they want to be retaliatory. They're either bitter at somebody else, they're either upset and bitter with themselves or they're upset or bitter at God. But whatever the case may be, we can't have life, love, and good days if we have anything that keeps us from being right with somebody else. Just like our study that we're about to do in small groups, Horizontal Jesus, our vertical relationship with the Lord will never be all it can be unless our horizontal relationship as Jesus is right. And so if I begin to get this right, this becomes even more glorious, that vertical relationship. And so here it's like, okay, what kind of horizontal relationships do you have? Well, I don't know when things don't go well. Now, when things go well, it's easy to be loving. Amen? It's easy, even the Bible talks about if you love others that love you, you really haven't done much. Why? Because it doesn't take much. It's just kind of like playing ping pong. They serve the love to you, and you just pop it back over to them, and they send the love back to you, and you just pop it back over to them. That's, That's good. That's easy. But what about if it's coming back evil, hurtful? Then what do you want to serve back? Well, you want, if they serve you evil, you want to serve back a little bit of evil. If they want to throw a little insult over your net, then you just pop a little insult back over on their side of the net. And that works good, doesn't it? Not. When you did that the last time, how well did that go? Not very well. It's kind of like almost people playing poker. I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll see your evil, and I'll raise your evil. Well, I'll see your evil and I'll raise it too. Well, I'll see your two evil and raise it. Same way with an insult. A comment, a cut. How will you do that? Well, I'll just see yours and raise you just a little bit. Well, I'll see yours and raise you just a little bit. Well, now you're out of chips. And you think, oh, wait, I remember some stuff that happened way back yonder. I'll go back to that safe and get me a little chips out of there. Even though that's way old, I'm running out of chips. Don't y'all look at me that way. You went back and got some old chips sometime, you know, you think. And so you go back there and you say, how about that chip right there? That's an old, old, old chip. I know, but I was out of chips and I got to get my insult for your insult. You see, that's how it goes. It destroys marriages, destroys homes, destroys lives, it destroys churches, it destroys businesses. 
because it's evil for evil, insult for insult. Jesus had to address that. Remember when he said, you've heard it of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If there's one quote of scripture that's probably said more times in movies than any other quote, it's that one. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And what they're doing, they're doing it to be able to say they can justify getting even. I mean, isn't that the common theme of a lot of movies? Revenge. And you sit there and watch it and go, oh boy, I love this. Because you're seeing somebody get revenge. But Jesus was setting it straight because it was in the Old Testament. But it was given to the judicial system to use. When you're in the judge's courtroom, then issue a verdict in the courtroom and make the punishment eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Make the punishment fit the crime is all that was. Now the people in Jesus' day were taking that verse meant for the judicial system and now using it to justify them getting even with each other and saying, okay, that guy did it to me, I'll do it to them. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, it's the Word of God. So it, it's not today that people just started misinterpreting the Word of God. It's been going on for a long, long time. Using the Word of God for their own gain. And that's not what it, and Jesus set them straight. Don't use it for personal use. You use it for the courthouse use. It's never intended. So we're not here to get even, insult for even, but we're not even here to be neutral. Do you notice this? There's a way you can, you, can, you can give evil for good. You can give evil for evil. And then you can give good for evil. And a lot of people, I think, add a fourth one. They do neutral for evil. In other words, they've done evil to me, I'll just stay neutral. Well, if you stay neutral, that kind of, after a while, that's going to go over to evil. It gradually moves that direction. But the scripture is saying, well, why don't you just give a blessing instead? You're thinking, yeah, I'll give them a blessing right there, a blessed left hook, you know. No, give them a blessing. This word blessing is from a Greek word that where we get the word eulogy from well of somebody, to do well of somebody. In other words, you do something good for them. That helps you get over it. <laughs> neutral many times does not. Saying, I'll just stay neutral on this. We'll just stay on level ground. I'm not going to. But for this kind of forgiving, non-retaliatory mindset, the Scripture says, if you want to have life, love, and good days, why don't you just give a blessing instead? See how that goes. See how that, and why are we able to do this? Why? Because we've been called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. We can do it because we've inherited a blessing of forgiveness. When we got salvation, we inherited a blessing of being forgiven of all our sins. And there was a boatload of them. Now, two, two of us agree that there was a boatload of them. Even if they were religious sins and pious sins and I'm a good Sunday school person sins of pride. I mean, whatever it was, it was sins and we got forgiven of all of it. And so since we've inherited a blessing like that, guess what? We can forgive anybody anything seeing that we've been forgiven the boatload. Nobody else is going to boatload us as much as we boatloaded the sins against God. We've inherited a blessing. We can give a blessing back. Because God gave us what we didn't deserve and we can give them what they didn't deserve. We got a blessing even though we were sinners, Christ died for us, we can give the blessing back to everybody else. Say, I can forgive that, man. That's an easy one compared to what God did for me. And boy, good days come around the corner because you think, man, that's, that feels good. I may be going through bad stuff, but man, that feels good to obey God that way, to be able to do what's right. You know, we won't get to it to a few more verses, but it's tied to this point. He mentions this almost the same thing in verse 11. He must, this kind of person must seek peace and pursue it. He must seek peace and pursue it. This word seek is a hunting term for hunters. The Greek word had to do with somebody that went out hunting down and tracking down their prey. They were so aggressive. They looked and they tracked and they, and they 
were camoed and everything to find their prey that they were hunting for. They went after it aggressively. And this is the term Peter uses here. You've got to be that aggressive in seeking peace and pursue it. Remember, they were being persecuted. That would have been real easy for them to say, I hate those Romans. I hate those people right there. No, pursue peace. Wednesday nights we're doing Romans 12. We'll be talking about that verse. As much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. As much as it depends on you and me. They may not want it, but we're to pursue it. We're to seek it. Why? That's the only way to life, love, and good days. I think I may have shared this years and years ago, but as I was preparing, I thought about it again, that when I was about 19, uh, couple had asked me would I help them move uh, furniture of one of their relatives that was going through a divorce and they needed to move everything out of their fern- out of their house and so I agreed yeah I mean they needed help so I had to pick up so boom we went over there got everything loaded good to go everything's done I get over to one of the other relatives house probably about a week later and one of the young kids comes out and looks at me and they said Let's call this guy's Bob, the one who's being divorced. Said, Bob's going to kill you. Like, why? Because he gave explicit instructions that no man was supposed to ever be in his house to move that furniture, and he found out you were. And I'm like, well, it would have been good for somebody to told me this. I'd honor anybody's request to not be in their home, but that information was not given to me when I was asked to move. I guess that didn't matter. I mean, next time, maybe a week later, over at that person's house, man, if Bob ever sees you, he's going to kill you. I said, for what? For being in his house. I said, again, I, I didn't know. Well, that went on for a while, and, and I knew what Bob looked like. <laughs> and I knew what I looked like. I mean, I had to run around in the shower to get wet. I was so skinny, but it, was, uh, it wouldn't have took much. It'd be like I had to Pluto just... You know, nailing them in the ground. And then one night I was reading my Bible and I came across this verse as I was reading. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and there remembers that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. And I kept reading after that. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, put on the brakes and go back. It was almost like I read it so fast, I was thinking that if I've done something to somebody, get it right. But then it, it had me go back, and I read it, and it didn't say that. It said, if your brother has something against you. And of course, I justified it to be able to go on. I said, I didn't know, Lord. I would have done it. And I didn't know. And I began to look at that verse, and it doesn't say anything about a, if a, you don't know. Or if you didn't do it intentionally. I couldn't find that any disclaimer in there. It just said what it said. And I couldn't read anymore. It was almost like saying, yes, you need to go to God's house, but you need to go to the person that's offended with your house first and get that reconciled. And then come and give your altar your worship. Now, it's not saying, don't, no, so a lot of you say, I miss church the next four, four Sundays after Pastor Tim's deal because I didn't go to, no, it's not saying that. It's just like, be right with God before you take the Lord's Supper. It's not saying don't take the Lord's Supper. It's saying get things right. In the same way here, it's not saying don't come to church, but you may need to go to somebody else's house before you come to God's house next week. And so I thought, well, you know, it's about 10, 30, 11 o'clock tonight, I, and I had had his phone number. I'd never actually spoke a conversation with him. We've never actually officially even met. I knew I was fixing to meet his gun if I ever saw him, but we'd never actually met one-on-one. And so I called the number. That was back when you had to dial it on the phone. There were no cell phones. And so I called. And, hey, and I'll call his name Bob. Bob, uh, this is uh, Tim. Uh, you know, the other day when I helped uh, move, I didn't... Uh, blankety blank 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 blankety blank 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 if I ever see you I'm going to kill you blank hang up and I thought that wasn't how I wanted that to turn out right there I thought it'd be a little different so being as stupid as I was I got at the phone and picked it up and I called again I thought I'm going to say it as fast as I can that I didn't know so that 
Hey, Bob, I didn't know that it was going to do that. Nobody ever told me not to go into your house. I didn't get that information. You blankety blank, and the same thing. I'm gonna, if I ever see you, I'm going to kill you. And I hung up again. And I said, man, I am not obeying this verse. So I got in my truck. I knew where he lived because I helped move all the stuff out of his house to where he, I don't know what he was sleeping on to live there, but because it, it was all pretty much moved out. And I drove over there. And out in front were two guys drinking beer. I said, this is not a good scenario here. <laughs> I could see myself on the, well, I really wouldn't saw myself. My, my family would have saw myself on the news about what happened. And I went right in front of the house and my soul and my spirit and the strength of the Lord said to stop, but my right foot could not push the brake. I just couldn't. My brain was saying, your life is valuable. Don't do something stupid and end your life. And I just passed the house right up. I turned back around. I said, okay, I'm going to do it this time. And I went and I tried it again. My right foot could not hit that brake for nothing. I just, it wouldn't go over and I just passed it again. And I began to think, how stupid is this? Are you just going to keep going up and down like that? It means something. Like, Lord, at least I drove by. He ought to know. And I said it from the car. I didn't mean it. Please forgive me. You know, roll the window down. <laughs> he wasn't even in the yard. He was just the two guys drinking beer. So I said, no. You know, I often think maybe we get so mature we don't want to do what God says because we become spiritual. I think back then I thought, you know what? If God's word said it, just do it. If you get killed, you get killed. So I pulled in. I stopped. I got out and the guys stopped me there in the yard. What are you doing here? I said, I'm going in there to tell Bob. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be there. I said, you go in there, he's going to kill you. I said, yeah, I've heard that. I said, but I got to do it. I got to get right with God. I said, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to, and I got to, and they saw me that I was broken. And, uh, and, and actually by that time, crying. I think there's a rule among men, you can't hit anybody that's crying. I think there's a... <laughs> Some unspoken. <laughs> and so they said, no, you go home. You go home, and we'll go tell him. So that's not what I want to do, but okay. So I got in my truck, and I drove back home. You say, well, you didn't do anything. I did all I could. You say, well, you didn't rectify it. I did all I could. I couldn't make it happen. And I had the peace of God. I drove home praising the Lord with the peace that flooded my soul. I got back to my house. I got to bed. I said, this is going to be good sleep because I obeyed God the best of my ability. And before I could get my head on the pillow, the phone rang. And I picked up the phone, and there was Bob crying. I said, I'm sorry. This wasn't about you. I'm so hurt over this divorce. I'm taking it out on anybody I can. And I'm taking it out, I was taking it out on you because you had moved all the stuff, so I, blame, I was blaming you, and you had nothing to do with it. I said, stay right there. I'm going to get in my truck. I'm going to come see you. And I came. We met. We encouraged. We prayed for each other. And to this day, I see him every now and then. It's a great relationship. Amen. Nothing wrong. It's, it's to God be the glory. It all happened. <laughs> and I'm not saying that for me because I didn't do anything. That was God. That was God. And I'm not saying anything about my bravery because <laughs> you saw that wasn't there. <laughs> there was no bravery when you passed the house three times. But God was faithful. And had that not turned out like that, it still, I did what I could. God was going to do the rest whether the guy came around or not. As much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. And now to this day when I see him, it's always a testimony of God's faithfulness. Not returning insult for in, insult. Not evil for evil. I could have went around talking about him like crazy. I could have avoided him. I could have said he's no good. But God wants us to do what we can do to seek and pursue peace at all costs for his honor and his glory. The third thing we need to keep is to keep our tongue under control. 
To the one who desires life and to love and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Lies, falsehoods, evil, wrong. Boy, our, our tongue can do a lot, can it? Even Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Oh man, it can do some damage. Matter of fact, God, when he made it in the physical body, because it's such an evil, vicious, destructive device, which it can be good too, but it can be so destructive, he put it in this cave called our mouth for safety and gave it a double door lock, teeth, click, and then lips on top of that so that any time it came out, you had to unlock both of those. The lips had to come open. The teeth had to cope open, and there it goes, out to do its damage. Maybe that's to slow down its destruction. Why? Because the one that seeks, he needs to keep his tongue from evil. He needs to keep it in there, in that little lockbox sometimes. Some people are, I just say what I think. It's on my mind to say it. How well is that working for you? You see, I'm up here speaking everything that's coming to my mind. But boy, when you're in a negative situation, a hurtful situation, an argumentative situation, something's a little conflict, if you start using that mentality, you're going to be in trouble quick saying what you think. And it comes out, and it's hurtful. You see, the tongue can be the most blessed gift given to men because it can encourage, and it can love, and it can help, and it can make you feel better. But boy, in a bad situation, in an evil situation, it can sure hurt bad. That guy that said sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me, he had some mental issues on that one right there. He didn't know what in the world he was talking about when that quote was happening because it hurts, and it hurts deep. And the Bible says if we're going to have life, love, and good days, you've got to keep that tongue under control and not say the things you want to say because they're hurtful. You say, well, I'll just say it and forgive it later. Remember, Eric, when we did that thing at preteen camp? We got a tube of toothpaste. We squirted that thing out on a piece of board and told one of the kids, won't you come up and put this back in this tube? Man, they got a little... St- Man, they worked and they worked. They said, you can't get this stuff back in a toothpaste tube. It's just impossible. And said, so it is with every word you speak. You can't get it back in there. If it's out, it's out. It's done its work, it's done its work. It's better to think ahead before it's said until after it's said. The next thing to have life, love, and good days to keep is keep your way pure. He must turn away from evil and do good. Your life not only is saved, but you're walking with God and you have no unconfessed sin And because whatever the confessed sin that you have in your life, that's going to limit your life, love, and good days maybe even physically, the number of days. Keeping your way pure. Lord, is there anything in me that's not right with you? Lord, am I doing good? Am I doing what's righteous? Am I doing what your word commands? Is there any area in my life that I'm not doing that I should be doing or I'm doing I need to stop? Lord, show me. A lot of people miss life, love, and good days because of strictly number four. They're unwilling to repent and get things right before the Lord when the Lord showed them something in particular. And then the last one. Keep your reward in mind. Why do I want to do one through four? Because of number five. Peter said, For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and His ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The eyes of the Lord. Some of you may say, well, the eyes of the Lord are on everybody. He's, he sees all. That's true. But that's not what this is talking about. We know the eyes of the Lord see everything. But he's saying in this 
context here, he's saying he's looking at them because with great parental care to see their needs, see their situation in order to care for them. Yes, he sees the wicked, what they're doing too. You ever been to an event that your children are in, whether it's a play, a sporting event, and, and whatever it is? You watched all the kids. Let's be honest. You mainly had your eyes on yours. Okay, four of us do. So the rest of you are not being honest because you like to watch your own mainly. You want to see that you're so proud of them. You're their parent. And you're, you just want to focus on them. I mean, yeah, you're rooting for the whole team, but there's that deal about they're your kid. And you're responsible for them, for their love and their care and everything that you want to provide for them. Oh, the eyes of the Lord are on everybody, but on the righteous. He's looking and seeing, oh, look at your detail of your life. And and I see that situation. Yeah, he sees everybody, but he sees it in order to meet that need. I want the Lord's eyes upon my situation. But me and Sister Margaret want the eyes of the Lord on our situation. But praise the Lord, we want it. We want God to do that for us. I want Him to look and say, Tim, I see what you're going through. I see your hurt. I see that situation. Oh, but even more than that, I want the ears of the Lord to attend to my prayers. Whoa, that's a reward there. If you're a Christian and you're saying, I'm praying, nobody's listening, you got a problem. You're just talking to the room if nobody's listening. Am I right? If there's nobody listening, that's the issue. Look at some other. King James says his ears are open as opposed to closed. Even the message, which is not a translation, but uh, sometimes I like to refer to it, listening and responding well. I remember one time we went on a hunt, and every hunter there had uh, a different phone provider than I did, and they, and they all had reception. I had a different phone provider, and I had none. Now, I had just as pretty a phone as they did. And I had all the apps they had, and I had uh, mine could do all the things there could do, except what it needed to do, which was to call somebody. I had no contact with anybody. I was like, I could brag around, well, I got a phone. (laughs) A lot of people say, I pray. Uh, I prayed. Well, I could have stood around while they're talking to their family going, hey, Rebecca, how you doing? And faked it (laughs) because nobody would have been hearing because I couldn't get in touch. My phone provider was not attentive so I could talk to somebody. I need an attentive ear when I pray because no attentive ear is just talking. I wouldn't even call that praying, I guess. Praying would entail that somebody's listening. Oh, when I'm acting this way, this next year, I want that reward. And what is the reward for the Christian? What greater reward could there be than to know he's watching you and he's attentive and listening to your prayers? Woo, that's good. That's good. Because I want an attentive Lord that's hearing my prayer. Oh, but just the opposite. If I'm not, the face of the Lord is against those who who do evil. Ah, the Lord is so good. And He's giving this reward that as I live this next year and I look, what do I need to do? I need to lovingly be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, Humble in spirit. Forgiving and non-retaliatory. Keeping my tongue under control. Keeping my way pure. Making sure everything's right between me and the Lord. And then keeping that reward before me. Why do I want to do all this? Well, if nothing else, to please the Lord, but also to have this reward that Peter wraps up with. For, since, because the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend their prayers. 
I can keep that this next year, those five keeps. And then begin to think, you know what? How I want to pursue life, love, and good days. That little verse nestled in that passage. I believe we all want that for 2018. Whereas we go out of this year, we're going to say we had life and love and good days. Circumstances, they may stay bad. I can't change everything. Neither did the people that he was writing to, as we mentioned. Heavy persecution, which didn't change. But he's telling them, in the midst of all that, you can still have life, love. And good days. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you stand to your feet, so our music team comes. The reason we have an invitation is to say, Lord, you've spoke to us in your word, but now what do we do with it? And this is our time to just take what's been given to us from the word and then take it and say, Lord, what does this mean to me? And I'd ask you to do that there. Maybe some of you, in the sound of my voice, maybe they have never come to know the Lord as your Savior. There can never be life, love, and good days until you come to have life. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and that more abundantly, and that starts with salvation. That starts with you surrendering your life to Christ asking Him to forgive you of all your sins and you turn your life over to Him. You quit driving your life. You get in the far back seat and let Him run it. You ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. If you've never done that, why wait? Life's too short. Start experiencing life, love, and good days. We'll have men up here at the front can share with you how to come to know Christ. Others maybe haven't joined the church that you've been praying and seeking the Lord and maybe the Lord's given you a word to join Believers Fellowship. You want to get plugged in to be able to minister and love one another more and be able to know each other's needs more and get plugged into the body of Christ. You can do that as well. Some of you may want to come forward for prayer. We know that so many are going through ailments and situations. May you want anointing. May you just need prayer for a situation you're going through. Be men up here at the front and pray with you. And you may, may want to come up here to the altar and pray just between you and the Lord. Some issue, something you're going through, something you're walking through, something you're facing, and you know you'll be facing again this next year. May you just want to lay it at the altar. This time is for us to individually just deal with any matter and just take it to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, may you just take over this invitation time. May you be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. As the music team plays, you respond.